Hello everyone! This is a small railway trip across West Siberia part 2, and we've just arrived in the glorious city of Omsk. It got warmer, and all the snow that had fallen during the day is now melting, turning the second largest city in Siberia into a little Venice. People of Omsk are famous for bizarre domestic accidents that happen to them. They are like Florida man of Russia that has drowned in a tractor tire or killed his wife, thinking she was a witch. All this madness is closely watched by winged doom, a giant bird wearing a medieval anti-black mask. It follows you everywhere and constantly reminds, do not try to leave Omsk. But even the dogs are trying to escape, sailing on the nice floor. The explicit surrealism of things happening gives the city a peculiar frame, tightly associated with the consumption of psychedelic drugs. The word Amich, which once upon a time meant the citizen of Omsk, today can be used as an euphemism for both a mind-altering enthusiast and a notorious addict. What has started as some innocent image board humor has escalated quickly, and now even the governor of Omsk region complains that these internet memes are scaring off the investors. Under the gaze of giant bird, life goes on as usual. Like in every other city of our planet, you can go into a bar and get yourself a delicious shawarma. Just need to be careful when eating it while walking on icy sidewalks. Omsk is 300 years old and once was the most important city in Siberia. So there are a lot of beautiful Tsarera historic buildings here. Towers of former 18th century fortress are peacefully coexisting with Soviet avant-garde experiments. Meaningless monstrous highways remind us about urban planning mistakes of the 20th century that transformed the city to the military parade ground by day and dangerous racing track at night. The totalitarian countries have suffered this approach the most, and massive Soviet government buildings were designed to dominate, oppress and make everyone feel small and insignificant. But that era also brought us a constructivist architecture, which has forever changed our world by introducing industrial assembled houses. Post-war period left Omsk with a number of buildings in imperial style, from modest mansions to imposing multi-store edifices, similar to ones you can find in Moscow. I've spent some time spotting Soviet shop signs, watching trolleybuses making left turns through the midday traffic jams, and supervising a hard job of a traffic inspector pulling cars in the middle of a highway and then it was the time to go back to the railway station. My next coach was not as fancy as the ones before. Everything was old and dirty, and the conductor told me not to drink my vodka because there were police officers on the train. We are crossing the Irtysh river and heading to a small town of Nozivayevsk, 150 km to the west. And again, while I was charging my drone battery, men were eating noodles. It's only 4 o'clock, but the sun is already going down. In less than 2 hours we arrive at the Nozivayevsk station, lit by the golden afterglow. The town of Nozovayevsk is very small according to Russian standards. Only 10,000 people live here, which puts it at approximately 900th place out of about a thousand Russian cities and towns moderated by population. The winter is just lovely here, away from dirty big cities. The snow is crystal clear, the life is slow and pleasant, and the highest building is three stories tall. But what's unusual and what brought me here is that this little town has a ferris wheel. This amazing ride can easily be seen from a train as a compartment window is looking out into this half of town. I'm sure I'm not the only one who has always been captured by the image of a giant attraction, proudly towering up behind bleak railroad barracks. It looks like something imaginary, something that doesn't really exist. A mirage in the cold Siberian steppe, seen by a traveler bored to death by an exhaustingly long train ride. The amusement park was expectedly close in winter, so I neither did get the chance to see the wheel in action nor experience the stunning aerial views on Azavayask with my own eyes. The temperature was about 20 degrees below zero, and it was very hard to control the drone emittance. The almost new iPad mini has discharged rapidly and turned off about 50% of battery left. Nevertheless, I did a great flight over the roofs of this lovely town, and couldn't stop to be delighted with the beauty of winter here, with the purity of snow, with the crispness of air, and with the endless step from where the town ends up until the horizon.
Nazavites will celebrate 110 years anniversary this summer. It was founded as a railway station on the alternative route to the Trans-Siberian Railway that was being constructed at that time, and became a hub for trading butter that was collected from surrounding villages and then exported as far as to the Western Europe. Prime Minister Stalipin once wrote to the Tsar that Siberian butter making is bringing more gold than the entire Siberian gold industry. Until the present days, the Nazavayevsk butter factory is the number one business in town. I'm very glad I came to Nazavayevsk and I'm meeting this magnificent sunset right here. Soon we'll need to lengthen this thing down and get back to the railway station to catch a commuter train back to Omsk, as I can't continue my journey from here. You see, Trans-Siberian Railway is not just one thread that goes through the harshest tundra and taiga of this planet, it has multiple routes. The historic one, that was built at the end of the 19th century, has soon reached its capacity limit, and in addition to adding a second track, they built an alternative route in the western part of railway, that was too starting in Moscow, passing through the northern regions and joining the historic route in Omsk. Nazavayevsk is located on that alternative route, which became the main, by the way, as it passes through the Ural Mountains more directly. But my next destination is the city of Kurgan, which is on the historic route, and that means I have to go back to Omsk and catch my train there. There is an 80 km long dirt road that connects Nazavayevsk with the historic road railway station of Iselkul, but the bus only goes there twice a week, and today is not the day. On this harsh land of impassable roads, the railway is often the only thread that connects people. Looks like I was lucky to catch some special train, where each coach is decorated according to some theme. Here we are, for example, in a sport theme coach, that features all the sports that people in the own region are performing at. Another coach is a children's coach, that has a playground and cartoon characters on its walls. I am surprised no less than you, it's not a bit in Russia, and I have never seen a playground in a commuter train before. Rumor has it there was gym equipment in the sports coach back in the days. Of course, we have a business class coach with business class seats, business class curtains, and some obnoxious medical show on the TV. I have to pay about 80 cents equivalent to be allowed on this premises, just can't find where. The commuter train trip takes about twice the time of the regular train. This land is not populated, and there are no towns or villages, so they are given names to railway platforms according to railway kilometer posts. By 9 o'clock I should be back in Omsk and have two more hours to enjoy the city in the night before catching my next train.